to have Dr. Fava join us today. Giovanni Fava received his medical degree from the University of Padua in 1977, where he went on to complete his residency in psychiatry in 1981. And for those of you who are not familiar with the University of Padua, it got its start in 1222, which is, uh, you know, a little over 400 years earlier than Harvard. So it's quite a place with uh, uh, graduates like um, Vesalius and Copernicus and um, William Harvey, and I guess Galileo was a professor there. So yeah, it's, right. it's quite a place. Um, uh, and I believe Maurizio went there too, is that right? Joe? Yes, yes, he did. So after working for several years in the US in Albuquerque and Buffalo, he went back to Italy in 1988 where he's been on faculty um, at the University of Bologna, but he maintained his faculty appointment in, in um, uh, psychiatry at the State University of New York at Buffalo. He has been a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Bologna since 97 and clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Buffalo since 1999. And since 92, he's been the editor in chief of psychotherapy and psychosomatics, a wonderful journal. It actually ranks fourth, I think, in terms of the science citation index for psychiatry journals, the impact factor of over 13. It wasn't that way when Giovanni <laughs> became editor. Um, he has over 500 uh, papers and has performed research in, in several fields. He, but as we said earlier in talking, he's a psychosomatic medicine guy like myself. Um, and he's also made major contributions in the diagnosis and treatment of affective disorders. And not only that, but he developed a type of psychotherapy called well-being therapy. And it's aimed at prevention, preventing patients from relapsing um, into depression. Uh, well-being therapy is a short-term strategy, emphasizes self-observation, it's real self-care therapy, use of a diary interaction uh, between patients and therapists. It's been described as a method to promote psychological resilience. He's also a proponent of clinometrics. This is a term introduced by Alvin Feinstein in the early 80s. Um, and it, it concerns a, a, a rating scales and instruments that we as clinicians can pr pragmatically use to improve patient care. We here at McCants are engaged in an effort to promote brain health and recognize the importance of designing a brain health care score which can be used in a clinometric way by primary care doctors. Since the vulnerability to brain dysfunction is likely associated with the relationship of allostatic load to one's brain health care score, we are excited to hear Dr. Fava's talk today on the clinical characterization of allostatic load. So Giovanni, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me this uh, uh, opportunity and uh, uh, let me start. Uh, I'm, I'm clicking on the last the slides. <laughs> Work. Uh, one second. I, it, it is always this way that. Uh, 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 And uh, they were here, but then I, I did something. Uh, I just did. You have so many talks to choose from. No, no. <laughs> I mean, the, the documents, of course, is, uh, is always. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I lost them and, and got them. Uh, again, so what what uh, uh, we try to do today is uh, uh, to give uh, a, an idea about uh, the clinical meaning of uh, the concept of uh, uh, allostatic load that uh, uh, <clears throat> the great neuroscientist uh, uh, Bruce McEwen uh, um, outlined uh, in. in at the end of the past century. <clears throat> so 
Bruce McEwen, uh, I'm sure everybody knows uh, his work and his outstanding commitment uh, uh, to uh, very broad uh, areas of interest. So he mm, put together this concept of allostatic load uh, as the cost of chronic exposure uh, to uh, cumulative stressful experiences. Uh, that result in disturbances at the uh, neuroendocrine, metabolic, cardiovascular, immunological levels. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, important at the beginning um, to try to understand three concepts. One is the concept uh, of allostasis. Allostasis uh, is a concept uh, that was introduced by another neuro scientist, Peter Sterling, University of Pennsylvania, and is the ability of the organism to achieve stability through change. Then we have uh, uh, allostatic load by McEwen. Uh, and McEwen was also mentioning in, uh, in some of his paper, the concept uh, uh, of allostatic overload. Uh, that is the presence of stressors exceeding individual coping skills. And that uh, concept uh, really attracted my attention. Uh, for many, many years, and even now, uh, uh, most of research on allostatic load is based on biological markers. We have here a list uh, of uh, uh, those that are uh, more frequently used. And uh, this research has been very uh, uh, important, but it had uh, a limitation. Uh, first of all, um, uh, all these assessments um, might not be easily available uh, in, in laboratory. And then uh, the results uh, may be also influenced but, uh, by factors that are not part of uh, uh, stress, but uh, they may have other causes. So, uh, Many years ago, we uh, uh, now it's uh, more than ten years uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, Jenny Guidi, uh, uh, um, clinical psychology at the University of Bologna, who's now really heading uh, the cutting uh, edge research in uh, allostatic load, uh, and Nicoletta Sunino. Uh, who's uh, uh, a clinical endocrinologist, uh, also happens to be my wife. Uh, we carried out uh, uh, a, a proposal about clinical assessment of uh, using clinimetric principles. Clinimetrics is the science of clinical measurements. And uh, and so we said, okay, there are the, these biomarkers, but what can't we have some uh, uh, clinical criteria for identifying uh, allostatic uh, overload? Um, we were also coming, and, and I'm glad Greg uh, mentioned the psychosomatic roots. Uh, we did a life event research, uh, uh, my MD thesis was on uh, life events and uh, ulcerative colitis and irritable bowel syndrome. And so th there is this long tradition. So I said, can we do something along those lines? And so <clears throat> we presented uh, uh, this uh, uh, criteria. Uh, uh, what are they? Uh, the presence, uh, first of all, of a current uh, identifiable source of the stress in the form of life events and or chronic stress exceeding the individual coping skills. See, first of all, uh, <clears throat> an amazing issue uh, and uh, which gives an idea of the greatness of uh, uh, Bruce McEwen's uh, 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 achievements is the fact that uh, uh, he combined 
the idea of uh, uh, life events, uh, life changes, and chronic stress, and put them together. And this, uh, 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 the presence of this stress, and we will examine this in a little bit more detail in a moment, uh, uh, is associated with symptoms which involve sleep, energy, uh, uh, irritability, sadness, anxiety, uh, or there is uh, uh, an impairment in social and uh, occupational function, or an impairment in what we call environmental mastery. Uh, one feels overwhelmed by the demands of uh, uh, everyday life. So uh, uh, <clears throat> the first criterion deals with the specification of the stress. See, if we go back to classic psychosomatic research on the events, uh, and I'd like to mention here uh, the work of George Brown and uh, Jim Pico, uh, develop a, a life event scale. Uh, they uh, were uh, outlining uh, uh, a concept of which was contextual threat. I mean, uh, it's fine you take a life event, but then you have to place the life event in a specific context. Uh, uh, if uh, in that context it may have uh, a different uh, meaning, um, if you lose money and you're also unemployed, <laughs> uh, that's definitely uh, uh, a different story. So that's the first criteria, the idea of a contextual threat. And the second criterion is the concern with the clinical manifestation of allostatic uh, uh, overload. Let me mention also a point here about uh, uh, clinical uh, manifestation of allostatic overload regardless of symptoms. Uh, there are some very specific uh, uh, points. Uh, generally, I mean, not every patient, but most of the patients uh, uh, get worse during weekends and uh, vacation time. And <laughs> it, it's not a, a coincidence. Um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's because uh, 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 prolonged stress may emerge at a certain time. Another staggering example is caregivers. Uh, many times uh, it, uh, we see people who have been taking care of relatives, uh, parents uh, for a long time, and they collapse. Uh, when, when, when the job is done, when uh, the job is over. Uh, so there are clinical manifestations and we should be looking for those. And so we devised uh, a, a semi-structural interview, a short interview, uh, uh, doesn't take longer than 10, 15 minutes at most, uh, uh, where we explore uh, uh, the life of, uh, of, uh, of the patient. Uh, let me mention here uh, the areas that uh, we uh, uh, <coughs> uh, explore with this interview, uh, which is uh, uh, recent life events, um, the major life changes that uh, might uh, have occur, um, chronic stress, I mean, McEwen's wisdom was to extend the idea of chronic stress to social economic disadvantages, work problems, unemployment, uh, and living in, uh, in, in bad areas, uh, not having enough green around. I mean, it's really a very uh, tension at home. Um, mobbing uh, increasingly common, uh, unfortunately, uh, event. Then uh, said environmental mastery, the feeling of being overwhelmed, uh, I cannot make it, sleep, uh, and, and we simply explore 
some basic uh, aspects of sleep. Uh, uh, somatization in terms of uh, uh, physical symptoms that uh, may be easily a functional symptoms attributed to stress and psychological uh, distress. Uh, <clears throat> we did uh, uh, a number, uh, there being a number of studies uh, uh, using the interview in medical populations, and um, uh, the interview identify uh, a, a, a good number of patients, uh, these patients with very different uh, disorders from congestive heart failure to fibromyalgia to primary care, essential hypertension uh, of patients meet the criteria for uh, allostatic overload by interview. And then uh, let me speak now about something that uh, may be very helpful in a busy clinical setting. And it has to do with the clinimetric index, uh, which is called the psychosocial index uh, um, that uh, uh, Nicoletta Sonino and I uh, uh, published uh, in 98. Uh, what is the psychosocial uh, index uh, and why it is important to state it's a clinimetric index is not a psychometric rating scale. Okay, so it's a self-rating Questionnaire, 55 items, so very uh, easy to be filled, um, requires five, 10 minutes, uh, uh, is given to the patients while they wait uh, uh, for, um, for, for, the, for the visit. And it has five domains, one psychological distress, the other illness behavior, the other is allostatic load, well-being, and quality of life. Uh, um, it's a clinimetric index in the sense that it can be used with scores as, as, as a common scale, like the back depression inventory or, or any other scale. That is the traditional uh, scale. Um, there could be algorithms which may indeed translated uh, with allostatic overload. Uh, but uh, the most interesting use uh, is that the clinician just looks at the responses and may formulate global judgments without any score. And uh, we show that there is high integrated uh, reliability with uh, this method. I'll show you in, in a moment uh, how it can be used that way. Uh, um, these are examples of studies uh, <clears throat> that involve clinical uh, and pathology, uh, hypoprolactinemia, Cushing syndrome, uh, primary steronism, uh, where the uh, psychosocial index discriminated between patients and controls. Uh, other studies. Uh, 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 in uh, patients in medical populations. Again, uh, this study, uh, the first study, uh, uh, patients with atrial fibrillation, and uh, we found a, a high percentage of, uh, of allostatic uh, lower overload associated with uh, um, um, atrial fibrillation. Um, again, uh, we are looking at things with a psychosomatic perspective. Uh, that means not every patient with atrial fibrillation has uh, allostatic overload, but uh, it's exceedingly common there. Um, and then let's speak uh, uh, um, for a moment uh, uh, about uh, uh, something uh, uh, that uh, uh, happened to me uh, uh, last year. A Chinese colleague. Uh, Dr. Wang um, was looking for my help uh, uh, about uh, uh, a clinical problem. Um, from his medical school, medical center <coughs> in Beijing, uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, medical doctors and nurses who volunteered 
to go to Wuhan in the uh, middle of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, uh, they worked there. And when they came back, uh, they were uh, 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 devastated. Uh, they were many times, uh, there were a lot of uh, problems. Uh, I got the idea that uh, we, we, we don't know what actually went on uh, in Rouen. We, we have only a very partial idea. So this Chinese colleague uh, was using the SM5. Uh, and uh, 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 and uh, was telling uh, his colleagues particularly, uh, look, you have, uh, uh, which is understandable, a post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, um, exposed uh, to a lot, uh, you have a major depressive disorder or other diagnosis. But then what happened is that his colleagues uh, uh, did not accept this, uh, 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 this psychiatric uh, uh, diagnosis. And they were kind of also resentful you you don't understand what what we went through and what we are experiencing. So uh, so this Chinese colleague asked me, so what are we doing wrong? And uh, and I told me, yes, uh, I think your colleagues are right. Uh, PTSD is. Uh, <laughs> What I actually said is a lousy diagnosis. Uh, is not. Uh, it has been overexpanded. It's not suitable. Why don't you use allostatic overload as a diagnosis? And you share it with your colleagues. And uh, he did. And uh, what was very, very rewarding to me is that uh, these colleagues, uh, physiologists, uh, cardiologists, uh, pneumatologists were saying, oh, this is really, this is what uh, we fear right now. Uh, we agree about this assessment. Now, tell us how we can recover, how can we get out of it? And, uh, and uh, they publish, uh, this group published in our journal this year, a study on uh, medical workers uh, uh, who were frontline uh, with uh, um, uh, the, the pandemics uh, in China uh, using the psychosocial index. Uh, they use the psychosocial index to determine uh, allostatic uh, 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 overload. And as you can see, <clears throat> it's not that it's everyone, but it's that 15% that requires special attention. And uh, uh, the second is a study which was performed in Hungary, again with the psychosocial index uh, in an elderly uh, community population that show a very uh, um, uh, strong relationship uh, between allostatic uh, load and lack of the exercise uh, and other uh, preventive measures in that uh, uh, population, again, during, during the pandemic. Uh, let me just give you now a, 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 an idea of, of a study that uh, uh, Jenny Guidi did uh, with uh, her group uh, uh, in, uh, in Bologna. Uh, these were 200 uh, patients in primary care before the COVID. Uh, now we, we have to specify when, when, uh, when uh, the study was done. And they were just randomly selected and uh, they used a structured clinical interview for the SM5 and the uh, uh, semi-structured interview for allostatic load together with the psychosocial index. And there were um, 31 cases, so about 15% again. And what is interesting of this slide is the fact that yes, half of this patient, even less than half, uh, 
and also a DSM diagnosis. But another uh, half had no, I mean, could have not been diagnosed with, uh, uh, with uh, DSM. And uh, uh, using the psychosocial index, uh, uh, there were striking differences between patients with allostatic uh, uh, overload and primary care patients who didn't have it. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jenny Guidi and Marcella Vicente, a PhD student uh, in, in psychology, did uh, a systematic review on the first systematic review on allostatic load and overload, whether assessed by kinetic methods or biological markers, and found a very strong association with uh, poor health outcomes and health damaging lifestyle habits. Um, so the, uh, 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 the mechanism really is that uh, uh, allostatic load uh, is uh, 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 a sort of pathophysiological bridge uh, that leads to changes in health and uh, disease that interact with a number uh, a number of factors, uh, this uh, uh, typical psychosomatic uh, uh, construct. Uh, and uh, 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 one conclusion uh, that uh, of the systematic review is that our healthcare system is uh, adequate uh, to deal with allostatic and load and overload because it's still based, uh, it's, uh, our medical system is the 19th century medical system and is based on artificial boundaries about medical specialty, uh, mostly organ systems, cardiology, endocrinology, gastroenterology, and so on. But, that's, <laughs> but these patients are across these boundaries. So uh, Nicoletta Sumino uh, uh, established a psychoneuroendocrinology service. Uh, psychoneuroendocrinology is a major area of interest also of Bruce McEwen. And what uh, uh, is uh, 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 sort of distinctive of this uh, uh, service uh, is the interdisciplinary expertise of the physician an endocrinologist, but with a psychosomatic background, uh, as uh, George Engel was an internist with a psychosomatic uh, background uh, and another leading psychosomatic investigator. And the fact that each visit uh, lasts one hour, which is <laughs> sometimes uh, 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 may, may sound incredible, but I show you that is absolutely necessary and saves a lot, a lot of time. And psychosocial evaluation through the psychosocial index, which is given to the patient before uh, he, gets, uh, uh, he gets into the office. And what uh, uh, um, the clinician is trying to pursue is lifestyle modification psychological support, explanatory therapy, I've explained the second what is, and rehabilitation uh, measure. Of course, these are aspects uh, that uh, uh, a clinical endocrinologist is very unlikely to deliver uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a classic endocrine clinic. And, uh, and I decided to present two cases uh, that were seen uh, in this service instead of uh, presenting cases from uh, our services, uh, uh, because I think they may show something that can be done also outside of psychiatry. And uh, let me just mention, however, uh, one clinimetric method uh, that is called macroanalysis. Don't get uh, <laughs> scared about this term macroanalysis. What is macroanalysis? It, it, you find that it's something that, uh, I mean, I think every clinician does it, uh, uh, even though you, one may not uh, call it this way. It's a relationship between 
co-occurring syndromes and problems on the basis of where treatment should begin uh, in the first uh, uh, place. Um, in, uh, in psychiatry, uh, we use uh, the worst and the most uh, reductionist uh, uh, method uh, uh, of comorbidity, which is linked uh, uh, to uh, diagnosis. Uh, all other uh, clinical areas of uh, medicine <laughs> are not limited to diagnosis. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and I, I show you how this is uh, an important limitation. Let's start from this young woman presented with uh, uh, abnormal uh, prolactin levels, uh, um, uh, oligomenorrhea, and uh, allostatic uh, overload. Uh, she went through uh, all the classic endocrine investigations, uh, excluding the presence of prolactinoma or, or, or other pathology. Let's uh, see what is uh, macroanalysis in action. So we put together, we write uh, uh, the problems of this patient. Yes, there are high prolactin levels, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, oligomenorrhea is a symptom, but uh, the clinician looking at the psychosocial index immediately perceived that uh, uh, there were problems with this patient. This woman was working in an Italian cafe, uh, working long hours, uh, Italian cafes open very, very early and close uh, very late. And uh, in, in, the, in the past year, uh, she had been taking care of her mother who was ill. So actually this woman was overworked. I mean, uh, between caregiving, her job, uh, poor sleep. And, uh, and, uh, and so what, what uh, but you need one hour to, uh, 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 to be able to uh, have a look at this and to intervene. And what the clinician did uh, was uh, to, to explain, this is ex explanatory therapy, which I introduced my uh, mentor, Robert Kellner, um, is the fact that you explain to the patient uh, a connection between elements. So you see, uh, you cannot go on this way with uh, such poor sleep. Uh, working so much, you need help. Uh, she did listen uh, to the endocrinologist, uh, look for help for her mother, uh, try to uh, limit her exposure uh, uh, to the work, uh, try to uh, keep uh, better care of herself, and prolactin went down. Uh, let's think of the same patient in a medical system uh, where uh, uh, patients are evaluated with 20 minute uh, uh, visit. She will keep on going, uh, cost a lot of uh, uh, unnecessary uh, in the uh, laboratory exam. So this is the first exam. Let me give you the second exam, example. Uh, this is a young woman with irritable bowel syndrome and recurrent uh, muscle tension headache. Um, she was having the symptoms. Her primary care physician uh, referred her uh, to uh, a psychiatrist. So there was a psychiatric uh, uh, evaluation. And the psychiatrist uh, um, uh, didn't find any psychiatric disorder. Uh, remember what I said before, that if you just go through the SM, you may not find anything uh, uh, according to the SM. Uh, but uh, he prescribed uh, uh, an antidepressant drug, nonetheless. You see, uh, chronic and differentiated uh, uh, psychiatrist uh, 
irreversibly brain damaged by propaganda are common and uh, everywhere. Fortunately, the patient didn't take the antidepressant. Uh, this was uh, actually um, a, a very uh, smart uh, woman, a journalist, a young journalist. Um, so when the, the clinician, the endocrinologist, uh, look at the psychosocial index, uh, uh, she perceived uh, that there were a lot of somatic symptoms. I mean, yes, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, yes, uh, muscle tension headache, but also other, which uh, uh, she um, uh, summarized in, in, in the definition of persistent somatization. She did find that that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, there was a state of allostatic overload uh, in this woman, but she also was also uh, uh, able to, uh, um, to pick up clinically that maybe there was something wrong about uh, the attitude of the patient to a job. Uh, because if you are a journalist, and uh, you are perfectionist, mm, <laughs> bad combination. Uh, and uh, uh, if you are not able to uh, assert yourself, that's another combination. So what the, the endocrinology did was uh, uh, suggested some lifestyle uh, modifications, explanatory therapy. I mean, she explained, I mean, you are, uh, you are under a lot of stress, and the stress manifests itself uh, in various organs. No one had ever explained this to the patient. And they referred the patient for the psychologist. Uh, uh, and the psychologist uh, uh, first uh, uh, used uh, cognitive behavioral methods addressing a phobic avoidance. What type of phobic avoidance this patient had? Uh, because of irritable bowel syndrome, she thought uh, that uh, lots of different types of food were hurting her bowels. <laughs> and so she was always over worried about what she was eating. Uh, and, uh, and the lack of environmental mastery was addressed by lighting therapy. Uh, just let me mention uh, lighting therapy is. Uh, a, a short-term uh, therapy uh, that is different from any other therapy uh, for one aspect. Uh, it's uh, based on self-observation of well-being. All other psychotherapies are based on self-observation of stress. And uh, we can see here uh, uh, the basic structure of well-being therapy. So there are initial sessions with checkup and monitoring of well-being. There are intermediate sessions uh, uh, where you work on the, uh, what uh, uh, makes, uh, makes uh, the obstacles uh, to the pursuit of well-being. And, uh, and, uh, and the final session, you try to uh, outline some lifestyle. Um, measures that uh, can increase uh, your psychological well-being. So uh, 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 the clinical implication load, uh, I'm writing here only a few, uh, is first of all, the identification of the high vulnerability state. Uh, and this applies to, to, to any disorder, also psychiatric disorder. If uh, a, a depressed patient goes through a, a state of allostatic load, uh, overload is likely to relapse. Intervention on lifestyle and a very important role also in unexplained medical symptoms and uh, functional uh, disorders. Uh, and and you have, from the two cases, you've got uh, an idea of uh, the potential. Uh, let me close my uh, lecture and then I'll be uh, happy to answer uh, to question with uh, 
the provocative title of, uh, of an editorial in the American Journal of Medicine, the Green Journal, uh, that appeared two years ago. Uh, are we ready to practice lifestyle uh, medicine? It's provocative. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 to make a uh, uh, sort of to, to close uh, 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 with, uh, with, uh, with a joke, in medicine, certainly uh, there is a long way uh, to go. In psychiatry, even more, because most of the psychiatry have no idea about what lifestyle medicine is. So there is, uh, uh, there is uh, 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 much more uh, work. Uh, okay, thank you for uh, uh, your attention. And again, I'll be, I'll be glad to uh, answer to uh, any question you may have. Uh, th thank you so much, Giovanni. Th 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 that was a very en enriching uh, lecture for us. Uh, you know, th the, the transdiagnostic nature of, of what you're proposing and studying is so important. Um, it's a non-DSM approach to the patient in terms of spending time and so on. And I'm always reminded of what Michael Trimble said about DSM, that it, it's a gardener's manual. It's not a botanist's manual, <laughs> in the in the sense that you're you know clustering symptoms and so on. So this is really really helpful um, uh, for us. I, 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 maybe people can put their questions in the chat box, and I can I can sift through them. But I did want to just sort of say that, that um, um, put a plug in for well-being therapy. I, re I remember a paper by Sheldon Cohen in, in, I think it was in JAMA, where he basically was able to point out that, that uh, self-rated health uh, in the medical outcomes study was actually the best way to predict uh, um, future health. And um, so, uh, and that that connection never occurred to me until you you pointed out that the that the the uniqueness of well-being therapy was um, um, uh, you know the self observation of well-being. So I think it's, it really has a, a wonderful place. Um, I I guess my question is about trauma, and um, you mentioned that you can take a take a view of of um, all allostatic overload as a, a way to, to describe uh, symptomatology that others might kind of call PTSD. But when, when I looked at your allostatic overload clinometric, um, do you think that, that, it, that um, when you're with a patient, you need to really focus down on trauma? Is it like a stress multiplier that that uh, causes so much allostatic overload that um, um, the vulnerability is is enormous, and we need to do something. Oh, yes, uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a, uh, um, a very a very good point. Uh, um, first of all, uh, um, let me uh, uh, clarify that uh, um, the diagnosis. I, I believe that the diagnosis of PTSD. Has been overextended and overexpanded, uh, and for instance, refer to patients undergoing surgery or or, or other or other uh, issues. Uh, and uh, most of, uh, uh, and one consequence uh, is that uh, you tend to apply methods that have been devised with a very uh, narrow segment of the clinical population. Uh, to uh, people who may have other disorders, whereas the, the concept of allostatic overload is much uh, wider. A major difference uh, uh, between well-being therapy and the other methods, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we don't have a controlled study, but we have uh, published uh, uh, case reports on this, that you may overcome, you may overcome uh, PTSD in this case, I mean, full blown, uh, without going through uh, the traumatic event. 
uh, so it's <laughs> we are really go <laughs> against any uh, uh, current uh, trend that you have to suffer again uh, to uh, to get it uh, to get things uh, over. Um, this is not necessarily true because if you are able to make uh, the uh, uh, the well-being that each one of us has inside uh, uh, grow, that may overcome uh, the event. So, but it's a completely different approach and uh, has not been tested uh, yet uh, in, in a control uh, in a control study. Thank you, Giovanni. We have a, a question from Olivia Okarecki. Thank you for a great talk. I noticed the striking overlap between the clinical characteristics of allostatic load and many of the physical and behavioral correlates of P, uh, PCOS, polycystic ovaries. Do you, do you see this relationship clinically? Which do you suppose is cause and which effect? Well, you see, uh, uh, something I mentioned is uh, uh, the close relationship uh, between uh, um, allostatic load and uh, a number of uh, uh, endocrine disorders. And, uh, um, and indeed, uh, uh, there is a, a, a study performed by Jenny Guidi in uh, uh, adolescent, uh, which uh, 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 outlines uh, this uh, relationship. So the point uh, is that uh, when uh, Nicoletta Sonino and I uh, did uh, uh, the first control studies on life events and Cushing syndrome or hyperprolactinemia, uh, endocrinologists were very, very uh, reluctant to uh, understand uh, that uh, there might be uh, a trigger, a life event trigger uh, to disorders. But now, through the concept of our studies, uh, we know that this is possible. So yes, there is a, there is a, a relationship, and these are areas which need to be uh, explored. Um, in endocrinology, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on quality of life, which is fine. But quality of life, uh, Alvin Feinstein did remember this, uh, tells you very little of what is going on in that specific uh, patient. Uh, thanks, Giovanni. Here's a question from Jonathan Rosan. Dr. Fava, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, at the McCann Center, we focus on giving our patients strategies they can adopt that are proven to reduce risk for brain disease. What strategy could we encourage that would improve resilience and perhaps bring allostatic load into better balance? Uh, <clears throat> one aspect of, uh, of, uh, of uh, well-being therapy <clears throat> is the uh, individualized focus. <clears throat> so in other words, uh, we need uh, for each patient uh, to outline, um, uh, let, let, let me put it this way, when, when, I, when I examine a patient, I do something that uh, 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 is, is quite unusual. Uh, my brother Maurizio says that I do, I do a lot of things that are quite unusual, <laughs> but uh, uh, this is one of them. I don't simply, uh, look at what's wrong, but also look at what is right, what is the strength of uh, uh, in that patient, and I try to build on that strength. So um, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you see, lifestyle medicine uh, encounters major problems when you try uh, to use the same package, the same approach, to everyone. And uh, in my opinion, you have to understand a little bit more about that individual uh, patient. And then uh, you can uh, outline uh, a treatment plan which is individualized. 
Uh, here's a question from Zaina Shamali. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fava. Fantastic talk. In neuropsychiatry clinics, we go over allostatic load all the time without naming it as such. Do you think we should start approaching patients with this title and explaining all? Also, it would be great if you could share any approach with allostatic load with patients with early onset dementia and whether you order or look into neuroendocrine disorders when you evaluate them. Uh, yes. Uh, it's uh, the, the two cases. I mean, you, you may not necessarily, I mean, you, if you use the term allostatic load, uh, it's, it's uh, the patient may have uh, trouble uh, understanding, but uh, the, what, what it really matters is for you uh, to use uh, uh, the meaning of allostatic load and to share it with, uh, with the patient. You can call it... <laughs> uh, uh, everything you you like and to be and to be uh, specific so the first case the hyperlactic level yes you can tell the patient you are under a lot of stress uh, which doesn't help maybe uh, a little bit but if you say you are under a lot of stress uh, because uh, you work uh, too long in the, in the cafe you spend too many hours with uh, 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 taking care of your mother and you sleep so little, you give some specific indication. So uh, the clinical value uh, lies in being specific about what's wrong in the life of the patient. Um, okay, here's a, um, a question from Akshita. Uh, thank you for a really stimulating talk, Dr. Fava. My question is about how you would tailor therapies for allostatic overload in underserved communities and communities deeply impacted by various social and environmental factors over which community members feel they have very little control. This is an important issue for the McCann Center. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. Uh, you see, one a major legacy of uh, Bruce McEwen's uh, work has been uh, uh, we should not uh, uh, think that uh, there are uh, uh, only individual solutions to allostatic load. Allostatic load uh, requires uh, uh, social, political, uh, economical interventions. Uh, uh, which go beyond uh, the individual uh, the individual case, and this is uh, um, in the first uh, issue of psychotherapy or psychosomatic this year. There was a, 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 an editorial by Ralph Howitz, uh, um, uh, remembering the um, Bruce McEwen, which really makes uh, this point clear. Uh, uh, we cannot thing of uh, uh, practicing medicine without uh, uh, a psychosocial context. Um, uh, and, uh, and being a, a former student of George Engel, uh, uh, I may say that, uh, you see, the biopsychosocial model was represented in psychiatry in the worst possible way. As, as a way of putting together things. But there was a strong psychosocial uh, uh, input uh, in, in that approach. We should not consider the patient uh, aside from the surrounding society. And, and let me also, I, I, I realize that I didn't answer to um, part of the previous question. Uh, <clears throat> It's, uh, uh, it's also very uh, about uh, early signs of dementia and, uh, and when the patients begin to realize that there's something wrong and this time of enormous uh, psychological stress for the patient, which many times gets neglected. And uh, 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 there's going, uh, there is uh, uh, a paper which is uh, forthcoming in, uh, in, in psychotherapy and psychosomatics uh, on the role of strategies for decreasing anxiety in this patient population is a control study. Uh, 
that really opens uh, a new area. But again, uh, are we ready for lifestyle medicine? <laughs> One last question. This is from Oliver Freudenreich. Uh, patients with serious mental illness have reduced stress tolerance primary and naturally elevated allostatic load as a result. Has well-being therapy been used in this patient group? Um, that is for patients with schizophrenia. Uh, no, uh, it's been used uh, in patients uh, with uh, uh, depression, um, psychotomic disorder, and uh, um, anxiety disorders. Uh, a few investigators have uh, uh, considered using well-being therapy also uh, in the setting of uh, 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 schizophrenia and psychotic disorder. Uh, particularly, uh, um, well-being therapy is something I didn't mention. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, well-being therapy is particularly effective when it's performed uh, uh, at the stage of the illness uh, where there is uh, at least partial recovery. Uh, this is what we did in depression. Uh, we address, uh, 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 we use uh, well-being therapy in the residual stage of depression. So this could be, I mean, to increase the skills of, uh, 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 of patients when the, uh, the most important symptoms uh, have uh, abated. It's a possibility, it has not been pursued yet. One, one uh, last um, um, little question would be, um, uh, Giovanni, if, if you had your way, how would you uh, use the allostatic um, overload measure that you and uh, Bruce put together in that paper in uh, a brain health uh, promotion setting? Uh, well, uh, there'll be, it's, it's, uh, uh, the question will require <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite a time. Uh, because you see, in a clinic setting, uh, we have seen that the use of the psychosocial index is really uh, the, the, the most practical uh, way uh, to go. Uh, then, you, of course, it depends on whether patients are able to uh, feel uh, the, uh, uh, the question. But uh, I would also use uh, the concept of allostatic load, uh, both with the patient, uh, but uh, very much uh, with the caregivers. I mean, we should pay uh, attention to people who are with the patient and, and, and the, the kind of, of stress uh, they are exposed to. And uh, uh, so I think that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that part, uh, so psychosocial index uh, uh, is probably the best way to go in a busy clinic setting. Um, uh, it allows also to uh, make additional questions where when you uh, speak uh, uh, with, the patient, with the patient and then uh, also having an idea uh, of what maybe the individualized focus, that's why your, your question could go on for, for long, <laughs> but uh, the question is whether certain targets are appropriate to that specific question, uh, that specific patient. So uh, I think there are, there are many, many uses, but uh, uh, it, it, it is of, uh, of, uh, of major relevance uh, uh, in, in brain disorders, uh, in my opinion. Well, thank you once again, Giovanni, for a very wise and inspiring talk today. Um, you've given us a, a lot of things to think about as we go forward. Okay. Uh, thank you. And, 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 and so I hope you can uh, carry on. Uh, uh, Bruce McEwen's uh, legacy and, and work on the, on the um, uh, allostatic load. And let me just close uh, with this. And then Bruce McEwen, I must say, was also extremely interested in uh, well-being therapy. Uh -huh. and, uh, and one of his last papers 
is is actually is it appearing in world psychiatry in in editorial is is on web in therapy that's wonderful yes yes it, it, you know he was as we said earlier he was such a, a modest but amazing um influential uh, scientist um so um you we, we should take his words to heart so uh, uh, and, and, you, and and you and yours too giovanni so yeah, Nicoleta you. is also <laughs> right, bye thank you dr fava <laughs> you're welcome bye. thank you bye Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.